It's the Frax Snow on Saturday yeah, for the half marathon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, I'm in. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a window. Okay. Here. okay. I won't sure that it softens with this. I ran it. The six to ten days. Oh, that's that significant. Yeah. yeah. All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to the joint work session, the 4 p.m. work just joint work session of the city council, also acting as the redevelopment agency. Uh, let the record reflect all council members are president or president or present. We're all presidents. All right, and you get us, yeah. You get a gavel, you get a gavel. Um, we'll begin with just a quick uh, council meeting review of the agenda. At 6 p.m., we have our council meeting. After our opening ceremony, we'll hear a report from administration. Uh, consideration of the appointment of Jared Johnson as Community and Economic Development Director uh, for Ogden City, and we will accept public input on that item. Um, any questions or comments or discussion on that? We had we had decided we would take comment uh, today and then. Um, uh, take action the following week um, and potentially take comment as well next week um, based on sounds like people are some are able to come today some are able to come next week so and then we will uh, move on into new business the proposed um, Ogden City flagpole ordinance uh, we've we talked about that last week in here um, Steve Burton will present that all right and then into public comments any any discussion item on the agenda. Okay, after council comments and mayor comments, we will consider adjourning into a closed session pursuant to one of the provisions listed. And that will take us in through the night. Okay, good deal. Uh, first up, um, I see, I don't see Mara. We have an administrative update. Um, we can just, we could start with um, the first item there would be uh, the water conservation program update. So invite Matt Hack up to come, to come on up and uh, present on that item. And maybe Brady as well. Yeah, Brady will come on that end. That end. <laughs> yeah. You got, some, you got some support on both ends there. Okay, good deal. Thank you for having me. Let's go. We'll turn that on. Let's try this out. So I'm Matthew Hack. I'm the water conservation coordinator for Ogden City. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do and how it benefits the residents. So it's kind of our item here is <clears throat> what we do to try to help them, try to help them lower their bill, use the water more efficiently. Um, and we're going to get into a little bit of that. So what I do is driven by the state's goals. So the goals set by the state are what we adhere to. Uh, we make a conservation plan. So that plan encompasses a lot of different details. And we have to update that every five years. One of the benefits of the five-year update is it gives us a chance to see where we are, how we're tracking. Our goal is to reach 175 gallons per capita daily by the year 26 or uh, 2065 is when that's set for. So with a long-term goal like that, you really need to have your kind of in-between checkups. We're accounting for population growth, industrial growth, things like that that'll use, could use a lot more water uh, in the sense of when we break that down per capita. If anyone doesn't know, the way we get per capita use is total water produced minus wholesale. And then that's just divided by population every day of the year. So that's how we get that figure. So Matt, is that is that including all the water that's leaking in the pipes? That does, yeah. Okay, thank so you. So that, that includes um, non-revenue or um, unmetered water okay. that way. Thank you. 
this is just a, a timeline here so you can see how we could use this to see where we are. Obviously, the 2030s still a ways out. <clears throat> you saw we're right around 193 right now. You see our 2030 goal there. Uh, Weber River, that's what we're looking at. So you can see right now we're tracking where we want to be. <clears throat> and then this is a graph. This is kind of interesting if you're not familiar with the system. So we've got a breakdown that's going to have both connections, but it's also going to have gallons uh, for each of those classes. We'd call these our classes. So you've got residential, commercial, industrial, institutional. So you see <clears throat> probably what sticks out to a lot of you guys is when you're looking at commercial, industrial, institutional, a uh, lot less connections, but then there's still a lot of water use per connection. So that's what's a little interesting when we're talking about those breakdowns that way. Uh, on the other hand, residential, you see when we do reach out to the residential, that is still our majority of connections out there. And that's also a majority of our consumption. <clears> then <throat> this just puts our annual water usage goal. You can see that with projected population. So that's figures that we've received on the last conservation plan. And you can see how essentially those two metrics are going to meet up to reach our goal. So you see what that would look like. And you mentioned a lot of that unaccounted for water. If we can target that, that helps us out in a big way. So a little bit about what I do. Probably one of the biggest things that impacts the residents the most or kind of the biggest impact is that I do proactive leak detection. So I utilize a software program that not only identifies the leaks, but I can also categorize them. <clears throat> so what that means is I can go high consumption to low consumption. I get familiar with obviously like an industrial connection where they're constantly filling a mill tank. They're always going to have use. They're always going to have a constant, what we'd call continuous consumption. That's why we don't call it a leak, a continuous leak, we used to call it that, but now it's continuous consumption because it could be deliberate or it could be something that's, you know, actively coming out of a faucet, for instance. This is just to let you see kind of the patterns I'm looking at. This would be like an irrigation pattern where you see this day's big, that day's low. We can see irrigation that way. We can see when the sprinklers are running at a residence. And I can even see in the middle of winter, I can actually see a report called irrigators last week. And I can actually see who is still has their sprinklers going. And every year we have at least one person who's still got their program up and running. <clears throat> yes. How do you identify that orange is a possible leak? What so, about that profile? So this is a, the orange that's made by the program. What it does is it'll take basically say two in the morning or basically where it baselines, where it flatlines, like where it's always at that rate. So it's, that's not like a guarantee that that's a leak, but that's what it'll do is it'll take that baseline and say, that's the amount that's always present no matter what. And that's where it'll code it orange like that. So, but I'll see a lot of these where the actual leak is, much bigger than that, or the actual continuous flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's just, um, then this, this one's a lot more evident. This one, you can actually see the irrigation cycles on there. And then you can see where something, that's what we'd call a burst leak. That's where something just went way up. And then you see how consistent that is. You see how that never, it never drops down. You can actually see where the program was changing its formula there. And it went from, partial blue, partial orange to where it'll say, hey, this is likely all a leak. But I I don't go strictly off of what it's saying is the continuous event. So another thing I do is landscape water audits. You, you folks have probably all heard about this, but um, that's where I'll do a checkup on the sprinkler system. So I'm looking at, for deficiencies in the system, and I'm also helping residents set a schedule that they can use. And I put three different tests that I do on here. Uh, one is the catch cup test. So you see that on 
assuming that's that side of the screen. So, <laughs> so the couch cups, um, that's used to determine your precipitation rate. That's what we call how much water is distributed. And the target, generally, if you have any kind of water holding capacity in your soil, is a half inch of water per irrigation. And the where that wouldn't apply is if you have a sandy soil, rocky soil, or you just have just a teeny bit of topsoil and then road base underneath, which we have some areas of town set up like that. The soil core is right in the middle, and that's where I'll use a core sampler to actually get a profile on there, uh, checking the root, how deep your roots go, as well as what the soil type is, what the water holding capacity might be of that. And then a pressure test you see going on, uh, that'd be uh, dynamic pressure is what we call that when the water's flowing, that'd be dynamic versus a static pressure. The reason we care about dynamic pressure on a sprinkler system, if you've ever driven by and you've seen the sprinklers going and the mist is just going everywhere, you can kind of see it on that first picture. That's a symptom of too high of pressure on there. Um, so we're seeing that right there. I think this one, I think that one was acceptable, but it unfortunately has a little bit of work to correct that because you actually do have to put a regulator on there. Uh, other incentives we do, we do the flip your strip program. Again, this is relatively new for us to do this. This program is where you take your park strip, assuming it has turf grass, and you would convert that to a low water use alternative. Water numbers, based on what the state has given us, the average park strip is between five to 8,000 gallons for the season. That would be like your total, how much water was used over the season. Uh, we, do, we don't do this, but we steer people towards the state website, the Utah Water Savers, for the toilet rebate as well as a smart sprinkler rebate. And those are both items that can help you use less water. And then as the city, we give out indoor conservation kits. Those consist of low flow aerators, shower heads, leak detection tablets. And then we also give out soil moisture meters. And that's what you see pictured there. That's to tell how much moisture is in your soil. The primary use of that is to see how far you can stretch in between your irrigation applications. So uh, just saving one irrigation application could be two to 3,000 gallons when we're talking one time through the sprinklers. So when we're doing our big conservation measures, even just, just one day less sprinkler application makes a really big difference. And then community outreach, I do some different types of setups. You'll see this is the Ogden Nature Center. And then I also do the garden fairs at Weber Basin. I use those to showcase uh, home water use and ways you can save water at home, but also to highlight where most of the water is used at home. And this this is often kind of a, you know, awakening to a lot of residents to realize how much water is actually used outdoors versus indoors. And then even within the indoors, seeing that breakdown can be pretty big. And then on the other side, you see the Weber County Water Fair. That's fourth and fifth graders usually. And that what you see there, that's our water model, which if you haven't seen that, it's over at the Public Works. You can go over and check it out. It's pretty neat to see how it works. That is actually based off of our local watershed. So that teaches the kids how the watershed works, like where, where our water comes from. And then also join that in with how that relates to conservation, what our water relies on. And once they understand the source water and what recharges our source water, it really puts that together. So that's a really good opportunity. And then the botanical gardens, we have a water efficient plant section and that gives residents an opportunity especially if they're doing the flip your strip to see what some of those plants look like and what we our coverage numbers like when we tell them how much coverage they need that that's at maturity so this gives them a 
sense of what the mature plant's going to look like. So it can help that way too. And just to see how those plants would interact with each other. So I believe that's it. That's all I have. So thank you guys again. Thanks, Matthew. Any yeah. questions or comments for Matthew? I have one question. Um, I've had um, residents reach out to me about the additional, not just the foot placement mm -hmm. program, but the lawn Lawn program. exchange. Yeah, yeah, the lawn exchange. Yep. Have we considered being involved in that? Or? So we've, we've considered that. We've put that forward. There's a fairly extensive agreement that yeah. goes with Just that like the other one coincides with that yeah and we're we're not quite ready it's two things it's the agreement which is binding by the county so it it's similar to the flip your, or flip your strip program but the other place we're a little apprehensive regards going on to private property and having that interaction on private property is a little bit different at this point, I'm not saying we're not going to revisit that, but that's currently where we are with it. I guess I don't know exactly what that means. Is that part of the program? Yeah, so the program for the lawn exchange, so as compared to the the park strip is a public right of way, so that's something okay. that we still have a little right. bit of <laughs> oversight on that. The landscape lawn exchange is front and side yards, so it'd be same concept, like you have a fully turf grass front and side yard and you would remove x amount of turf grass and replace that with drip irrigation low water use plants so it'd be same principle but where it's on the private property that's just a little it can introduce some different challenges uh, i was on the, the water tour with Weber Basin last spring, mm -hmm. and uh, I was sitting next to the lady at Weber Basin that was talking about this, that's mm -hmm. kind of over that. Yeah. For Weber Basin, and, and it, my understanding was, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a, it was a legislative initiative, um, not last year, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess it was the year before, and it was the state that's actually going to fund mm -hmm. the yeah. incentive, right? Yep. That's correct. So, so I guess maybe my question is: I, I, from talking to her, I didn't think there was that much that we had to do to mm -hmm. jump through the hoops to get qualified for that. Mm -hmm. Can you can you express? Can you tell us what what the issues really are? Yeah, we we looked at it. So it was, I I know what you're saying. Like they would essentially Weber Basin would run the program, and that's that's how it was presented to us. And I can't speak for everyone in that meeting where we discussed that, but it was still, it's something where we still want oversight similar to the flip your strip. Like we still want oversight from a code services standpoint, from a planning standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I think we just weren't fully aligned with it. And that's where maybe we could revisit that and see, because uh, again, it was that. And then the agreement where it is something that they sign with the county that's saying once we convert this, it'll it's never be work. it's not gonna go back. And that's where we are a little more hesitant when it's the private property. When it's the park strip, we kind of had a pretty broad agreement that like a lot of people agree the park strip's kind of a pointless place for turf because you're not throwing the softball or playing football on the park strip. Which some of our areas have park strips big enough to do that but in general that's kind of seen as like okay we'll kind yeah. of forfeit that our problem is if someone converts their front and side yard let's say they do the whole thing and they sell the house someone else moves in and they want to utilize that for slip and slides and uh -huh. anything else if they were to convert that back they could actually get fined for doing that that'll come to the new homeowner not the person who signed the agreement it'll come to the current property owner is that something that gets posted on the title or something when yeah they accept yep. the money it will be yeah so okay so and it's we've like actually, anything else that, that yeah any other agreement that the previous owner made that yeah it's yep. perpetual okay. that's correct so it is something that mm -hmm. can get even though the person who agreed to all this is gone the current 
resident is who has to pay for it and who would then have to convert it back. So that's where it's, uh, we weren't quite comfortable going down that avenue just yet. So we wouldn't be the ones giving the fine or anything. It would be the state or the county. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, well, Weaver Basin is the, the, the enforcer, the police of it all. I'm sure right? it's not the term they use, but yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. So why does the city, I guess because of the code issue, but why, mm -hmm. otherwise, why does the city have to be involved? The city would be involved from a landscape code. Yeah, you have to get it approved. Like right? we still yeah. want. Yeah, yeah um, there's going to be certain green space requirements and everything from a planning perspective that we definitely want to be very much involved as in, in keeping control of that. And um, that's one of the things that was very concerning is if and when, like what Matt was saying, if they convert their whole front or well, their whole yard in the front, then it's obviously going to break some of the codes that we potentially have at the city that could be conflicting if it, if they don't have meet certain green space requirements. And so if those are somewhat conflicting from planning and what Weaver Basin is requiring, then that's, yeah, we just well, don't want to have issues. Well, I don't mean to speak for you, but I'd be happy to go through that and fix the ordinance. We need to change the ordinance in some way so that we can make it work. Well, that's why I'm asking the yeah. questions is yeah. because, you know, we do we do make ordinance. That's yeah. that's our job. Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding from that conversation I had is that one of the things that, that we have is we have to change our ordinance that whenever there's a new permit, mm -hmm. it can't it not only can it require, but it, it can't allow more than X percentage of turf grass mm -hmm. on the on the lot. Mm -hmm. And and it seems like that's the way things are trending anyway. I don't see there's gonna be a lot of pushback if we went that way. Mm -hmm. Um so so I, I think what I'm suggesting is maybe we find out what those bullet points are, what those and let's let's figure out where we are, talk between administration and council and see if we can't find the find the common ground and see mm -hmm. if we can get to that point where our our residents can qualify for that mm -hmm. that uh, lawn replacement program i get what you're saying though that mm -hmm. you know if, yeah. if the owner before you does it you're mm -hmm. married to it yeah exactly um it's not the only thing that's that way though yeah, that's so, what i'm true. thinking too is you might be worth it to them to pay a fine to change it if they want or, to or maybe they buy it back or something. yeah that yeah see i don't know. know that's what i don't know is um if they can even do that, like if, if they can pay it off, so to speak, or if it's driven, we will have to clarify that. It's just like if you have to buy a house in East Central and you want to paint the brick, you're right. going to be able to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's similar. So, I mean, similar in that regard. Um, from a usability standpoint, though, that's like probably, probably aesthetic good. versus usability would <laughs> kind of be the difference there. Yeah. And I just, I guess from my, I'm in agreement with you because it took us like two years to get the flip the strip program mm -hmm. figured out. So maybe we should start this process. So then in two years, people can be eligible. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I think we could, even our ordinance, we could maybe say you can't do a hundred percent. You don't mm -hmm. qualify for a hundred percent. Um But find out what, what, what is reasonable. Mm -hmm. I think everybody wants a little patch of grass for mm -hmm. the barbecue or whatever it is. Material. Uh, well, yeah, um, I, I can only speak for myself, really. I, I've wiped out most of my grass, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you. yeah. And, uh, but I do want to keep some grass mm -hmm. and I want it to be nice grass. You know, I want it to be well watered and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, lay it on the grass and cut a grass. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've, I've been willing to sacrifice the rest of the grass mm -hmm. and do that. And I, and I think that's kind of where most people find themselves is. You know they'll they'll figure out what's important to them, mm -hmm. and and it's front yard side yard. Some houses are front yard bias. I mean, like they're way more front yard than backyard. Mm -hmm. So because often the reasoning is, well, your backyard's probably where you want to play, not your front yard mm -hmm. by the street. But we do have a lot of properties where the front yard is actually the kind of the main mm -hmm. yard. And then Brady, correct me if I'm wrong, but. The other part of this is we do, if we want to continue to have Weber Basin's uh, half, their dollar fifty on or dollar twenty five on the park strip, that agreement does expire after our five years mm -hmm. if we don't agree to their new what they're trying to get us to agree to with that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I heard that too. I guess is there any apprehension from the council that would have like if Weber Basin wanted us to partner on on the private side, 
of meaning the others like if there's any funding that they want to match that way if because i know that there's been mixed uh, opinions that we've received on on our end as to whether or not we should contribute funds to private side properties i think we'd be on board if it's the state funds that are kicking in on the private side however if it's they're going to be asking us for some of the city funds for the private side is that something that we should be I'd, doing I'd, I'd have a harder time with that personally but Okay, because yeah. that's one of the questions that I, I'm sure will come up is it in the event that it's all state funds, then I think we'd probably be more on board. But yeah, that's something we can definitely revisit internally and see where, where it goes. So within the education component, yes, are you also speaking to what not to do? Yes. Thank you. Yep. So you're saying one. Well, well, do you want specifically children or do you want adults or both? Well, adults are going to spread the rock mm -hmm. across 100% oh, of your with yard. The program. Okay. I'm, I'm not talking about a program. I'm just mm -hmm. talking about somebody's own initiative to mm -hmm. tear out their grass. And yeah. I mean, we see it all over town where yeah. the black tarp goes down and they kill the lawn and then they haul in a bunch mm -hmm. of gravel and, yeah. and call it good. And it's yeah. not good. Mm -hmm. So are we speaking to that? Yeah. And that would be uh, planning and code services where they're, yeah, if you see no, like I, a, I know that's wrong, but are yeah. we talking to the in our education that mm -hmm. we're putting forth? Are we always talk? Are we also talking about don't do this? Yeah, when they reach out to me, I do, and I steer them towards a site called Local Scapes, and that actually gives really good examples of how you can do a water efficient landscape that still incorporates plants. It's got rocks usually, but it's enough of a mixture where it'll still have that coverage. And that's what I'll usually bring up to them is the coverage requirements. And that's where they would have to take out their land use permit and they would have to approve that. But I do agree, you drive around town, you do see a lot of examples and you can immediately tell it's not a flip your strip program uh, because it's not gonna have any landscape, right. meaning no trees, no living ground cover, anything like that. So if it's just rocks, you can tell that it's something that was just done overnight um, without a permit. So Utah Water Savers is a really good resource, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I, I'm what I'm. I, I a lot of people don't think to go there. They just order the gravel. Mm -hmm. right. Well, that's that. That is an enforcement issue entirely. I I don't know how you can educate out of that. Because some people aren't gonna, they don't really care to start out with. They only care if they get the fine. I, yeah. I guess well, as, they, we, as we see some of the stuff that's going on that potentially they don't have a permit and we don't have them on our list, mm -hmm. we will engage them in those situations and say, "Do you have a permit or what's going on?" In effort so that we also are protecting other utilities or other infrastructure like sidewalks and stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we sometimes they might be weekend warriors that are trying to yeah. Well, put it that, in and then we don't that's kind it, of the case so. where if you see some guy getting a bunch of paint out getting ready to paint his brick you call right now before he does it same thing when the big load of the gravel gets dumped on the front lawn mm -hmm. you may be better you know be able get to it before the so, shovel so that they don't get too far ahead of themselves yeah. that's that mm -hmm. and usually it's not the front lawn usually it's right in the road which is another violation yeah. so uh, again yeah and i've called in quite a few of those uh to code services to get it right in the bud because it's so much easier right at that point versus if you wait till the project's done on the other side of that i've shut down flip your strip projects and they had to remove all their fill and remove all their weed barrier because they jumped ahead and they put in the wrong kind of weed barrier so they put in a non-permeable weed barrier so the driver behind that is we really want these to succeed. Like we really want anything that's gone through this program to succeed and really to be easy to maintain, uh, pleasing to look at, et cetera. So we have a lot of skin in this just because we want it to be a success that way. And we want that to be the example for the neighbors to see it done like that versus done like you mentioned, where it's just, Right. Rocks. So if, if you walk by your display at the Ogden Nature Center, you're going to mm -hmm. see what mm -hmm. not to do? We we can incorporate that. We could add that to. That's kind of what I was getting about, at. Like you a, know, if we can, if we can yeah. get out in front of it all before yeah. the gravel is actually dumped in the street. Kind of a this, not that. 
yeah. type of setup. This, not that. Yeah, yeah exactly. We, and, I, and I've seen that. And yeah, we, we can definitely incorporate that, kind of tie the two together, kind of put the flip your strip more on that display as well. One, oh, thanks, one thing when they do go through the flip your strip program is they will go through an educational component of it before they even start putting their plans together to where that should lay it out enough, hopefully to where it's clear as to what they should or shouldn't do, but we can, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Well, in, 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 I, I know the answer to this, I think, how many people have gone through the flip your strip program successfully and how many have just flipped their strip and think they've done it? what has a greater number you mean I, like do you mean like who have just done it without the program is that what you're saying exactly. i would say if you were to tally it i'd say there's probably quite a few more that have just done, done it yeah, yeah if you were to tally that because we've got 25 mm -hmm. that have fully executed the program and yeah i would venture to say i'd hazard that guess that there's quite a yeah. few more that have taken it upon themselves so Sounds good. Well, hey, I we appreciate this. I think right. um, or one. I just want, I have one one yeah. comment. Um, so I just saw a recent survey that a lot of people are not seeing. Um, we've had some really good water years mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, and that people don't see that as like a number one or a number two. It's like a number ten or eleven issue. Yeah. Um, impacting the state. So, um, I, I think getting out ahead. I mean, the, the plan is great, but getting out ahead on the communications mm -hmm. plan is probably going to be really important, um, mm -hmm. you know, just to get to reach those goals. So, yeah. And that's, that's a very hard one in a good water year. And we're kind of, we thread the line. We always want a conservation mindset. We also don't want to be the boy who cried wolf because when we're in a really dire situation, we really want it to be heard when we're doing really severe cutbacks. So we always want to target that, try to find anywhere that we can reduce water consumption just day to day. But as far as the really big restrictions and things of that nature, uh, that's where we do reserve those. But it is, it is kind of an up and down. And part of that educational is to realize like, hey, we could have a good water year, but we could then get three consecutive really poor water years, which puts us right back to that dire situation. So it's um, <clears throat> not just changing the amount of water, but it's, it's the behavioral. And that's the hardest thing to change, as I'm sure all of you are aware, is to change the behavior and make it where you are using less water than you previously used. But that long-term goal, that's what we're trying to target. So I appreciate that. Perfect. All right, so there's no official administer action on this item. It's, it was an informational update, so we appreciate you coming All to right. do that. There are a few takeaways, however, that we'll check in on with regard mm -hmm. to the um, the lawn replacement program and that. So thanks for thanks for sharing with us. Absolutely. Yeah. And then thanks. we're just going to leave thanks a box with some of the kits that he provides, or well, the oh, okay. water division provides. Yes. So if you're we'll interested in those. those kits, you can take some of those Wonderful. kits by the door here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Up oh. next, we have Lorenzo Long, our sustainability coordinator. Um, welcome. Uh, talk to us about the uh, stewardship or the Natural Resource and Sustainability Stewardship Committee Ordinance Amendments. It's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> a little bit of a mouthful. All right. Yeah, as he said, uh, my name is Lorenzo Long. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the city. Um, and I just, I'm here to speak about a request from our Ogden City Natural Resources and Sustainability Stewardship Committee. Um, I don't have a visual aid, sorry about that, um, but it's a fairly simple uh, a request. So um, our committee has been having a, a little bit of a tough time uh, filling out its membership. And oftentimes when we go out to uh, public events such as the farmer's market or, or what have you, uh, we, we interact a lot with people at those events, right? And a lot of times people want to be a part of the committee um, because the people at those events that we go to tend to be fairly sustainability minded. And um, But a lot of the times they don't qualify to be on the committee because they are not Ogden residents. And uh, a lot of the time, you know, maybe it's someone who just lives right across the street from the Ogden city border, right? And they're essentially, you know, they, they spend most of their time in Ogden. They, they work here or they go to school here or 
you know, church or whatever, um, but they but they don't qualify to be on our committee on, on our committee just because, uh, as currently stated in the ordinance, uh, it says you have to be a resident of Ogden City to be on the on the committee. So uh, what they have asked is for that to potentially be changed to allow qualified uh, experts from outside the city to be able to be allowed to be uh, members of the committee, and. Um, so that's really the, re the request there. Um, however, we did put in there to structure it similar to, uh, I believe it's the arts committee that um, doesn't, basically they allow people from outside the city to be um, members of the committee, but a majority of the committee members still have to be Ogden city residents. So by and large, the committee is still majority Ogden residents. Um, and then, you know, while we, while we were in there, you know, tinkering around with the ordinance, we noticed that there's some language there that uh, states that the committee is run basically under the public services uh, department and director. And so we went ahead and just changed that to reflect city sustainability staff instead. So just a little change there as well. So that's that's the, uh, the general idea of, of the request there from the committee. All right. Lorenzo, I think you had mentioned to me that you kind of are trying to model it after some other committees that we we already have allowed them to do this. So what were the, like, was it the airport or I can't remember? Uh, the arts committee arts is the one that we stated. Yeah. 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 And so, so it's nothing that we haven't done previously. No. Lorenzo, I have a question if that's all right. Yes. Sure, yes. Um, so the reason it was under public works is because, or public services, is because that's the department that the sustainability committee was operating under. So what department will it under operate under now? So I am in the management services department. So, so should it be changed to management services department? It, probably the Lorenzo's position wasn't, wasn't a position Correct. when it... No, it was. It was first. It, that, it, it was, yeah. Was it really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought we had added that. I, I believe my position was created after the, the committee was up, up and operating. That, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. So that's that's what I was just saying. And so, okay. So should it be under management services, I guess? that's Maybe at, I would ask management services what they think. What do you think? <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> So, yeah. Come on, come on. Yeah, come on up. Matter, there's if a it matters right services or under sustainability office. Um, so Lorenzo does come to our 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 meetings. Um, it's actually a good place for the sustainability committee because we work with all departments, um, to help the city function. Um, he works on the ninth floor, so he's close to the mayor's office and and has the CAOs in the mayor's ear. At times, it, it it is a good fit. It, it's been working okay. Should the um, committee um, be managed by the sustainability office or the management services? I guess that's the question that I've heard. To my knowledge, there is no sustainability office. I, I'm just in management services. Yeah. You're one office, yeah. Because it says sustainability staff. Yeah. I wanted to keep that uh, somewhat ambiguous to allow for in the future any if growth. there's yeah any yeah, growth or anything like department. that yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay we'll have a question yeah um so the mission of of the sustainability committee and i could be wrong i, I guess i'm looking for a little education here is to do things put things in in ordinance that are beneficial to our conservation of our resources and natural resources and and it may have tax implications for our citizens and things of that nature is, it, is that true or no yeah that, that that's true their their main purpose is to be a resource and a sounding board for the mayor and the council mm -hmm. um that's the general purpose but you know in the ordinance uh, in the city code it does talk about how they are responsible for educational programs uh, in certain topic areas, policies and programs, like you mentioned, mm 
uh, grants, state and federal programs, and then, yeah, serving in an advisory capacity. So their duties are fairly broad, and there's a lot of room for them to operate within those uh, boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so in the absence of, you know, questions or, or issues coming from the mayor and the council, they work on those kind of educational pieces or, or other issues that they see as important. Okay, I, that's probably, that, that cleared it up, I think, for me. I, I guess I was initially concerned that if we had somebody uh, from Marriott Slaterville that wanted to be busting the Ogden City people around. I see what you're in, saying. In short, yeah. and, uh, or, or doing things that would maybe cost residents tax money. Or yeah, I see what you're like saying that. there. And but I where, think that's... But where you're uh, an advisory committee, I, I think that's probably the the buffer behind all that stuff. So I, I don't probably have any real concern about that either. But yeah, they don't. But I am working on your district two. Oh, thank you. So, I, uh, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, we really, really want someone from district two on, on the committee yeah, for sure. I'm working on it for you. Um, and that kind of goes back to as well. Um, the majority of the committee would always be Ogden residents. And so when, you know, if they're taking votes as a committee on, you know, what do we want to do with a certain issue or, or whatever, then the majority would still be Ogden residents that are taking that vote. So all right. This looks like it's uh, um, scheduled for action next week in mm -hmm. our council meeting. Can we make another idea that perhaps that all the Ogden City residents aren't from District Four? <laughs> I I would love to have a wide a yeah, wide I, I representation. I, you know, it's the same old deal. It's it's gonna. I'm gonna harp on this for a while. I think. Well, it's what I suspect. Yeah, and it says one member from each of the four municipal districts, where possible and practical. Yeah, so that's just... where. To give an idea, right now, our current makeup is four of our committee members from District 3, one from District 1, and one from District 4, actually. And so we're... Yeah. 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 So... Yeah, District 3 for the win. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yes, please, District 2, I would love that. I would really love that. Yeah, we're... We're practically we're District 2 over awesome. there. Right next door. Awesome. <laughs> It probably was in the past. It could have been because there was a ship there. Okay. So it also was suggested that maybe we look at changing the name of That's it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think uh, Chair Richie stumbled over it even when he was first introducing <laughs> yes, it. Yes. So I think that kind of gets to the root of the issue when we are out talking to people. Um, it's a mouthful <laughs> to say that a lot of times. You know, the Ogden City Natural Resources and Sustainability Stewardship Committee, you know. They don't even have a cool acronym that you can use. That's true. Um <laughs> So I don't know if you guys have any ideas of what you would want that to be or or anything. If not, I, I have a suggestion, but you don't like NRSSCO? NRSSCO. <laughs> <laughs> suggestion. Nobody said anything. I didn't even get a thumb up or anything. Oh. Just taking out stewardship, right? I just said, yeah, how about the resource conservation committee? Resource conservation. That could be good. I, I think it needs to say sustainability in the sustainability. What about what was your idea, Lorenzo? My idea, colloquially, colloquially, I can't even say that word right now. <laughs> but we always tell people it's sustainability, it's the sustainability committee, um, just because it's it's faster. So my my suggestion would be the most simple one, which would be the sustainability committee. And the reason behind that, I think, is it still leaves it general enough to allow them to accurately communicate what the purpose of the committee is, and it really is sustainability, which is a wide umbrella, and that includes natural resources and resource conservation and all the other issues. So that, and also a lot of other cities tend to call their committees that, um, those that have a committee that is similar to ours. So that would be my suggestion, but definitely open to other other ideas, um, but that would be it for simplicity. Much shorter. Much shorter. Does everyone feel good about sustainability committee? <laughs> okay. We're all happy with that. I think that's, that's what I called it anyway. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yes, yes. So let's make that change and then we'll take action next week. Okay. Great. Then we will we be able to do it by next week? I guess that's a question. I, I think actually you could probably just make that by motion. By we won't need week. a new ordinance by next week. So we could just move forward and then get a new ordinance. You know, just do it by motion. So. Okay. We'll we'll have some language for you. Thank you. Glenn, you remember that for us? One of the Items okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, we have um, we have uh, fiscal year 2024-25 annual action plan program guideline changes for the health program. Yeah, so, so well, yeah, we'll definitely come back. So Jeremy Smith, 
and Kathy Fuentes. You, you guys decide there, the, the heads and tails side of the table. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, Welcome. hi, I'm Kathy Fuentes, um, Community Development Pro um, Coordinator. <laughs> thank you for your time today to consider the um, proposed annual action plan for fiscal year 2025. Our agenda will be a quick review of the five-year consolidated plan, the proposed annual action plan for fiscal year 25, the health uh, information item, the Healthy Homes uh, Grant, Weber Morgan grant, well, it's just an information item, our proposed help program guideline changes, and April is Fair Housing Month, and we will review our schedule for adoption of the annual action plan and the help program guidelines. Okay, so the five-year consolidated plan is the mechanism in which the city receives HUD grants. It is a strategic planning tool, and it outlines what the city plans to do with HUD funds for the five-year period. If it's not specified in the con plan, then HUD funds cannot fund it. Um, an uh, amendment would be required to add, delete, or significantly modify a program or a budget. So the five-year consolidated plan is the application for HUD grant entitlement status. Once the five-year con consolidated plan is approved, then the city is entitled to the Community Development Block Grant and the Home Investment Partnerships Grant, which we call the Home Grant. The amount that the city receives is based on a formula. So sometimes they're called a formula grant. So the five-year consolidated plan is the structure and what we can spend our HUD dollars on. The annual action plan implements the five-year consolidated plan. So annual action plan for fiscal year 25 is the fifth and final year of the of the five-year consolidated plan. It details the budget for the use of HUD funds for the year. It identifies what programs and projects will be funded in the year, and it outlines our goals for the use of HUD funds. It does require public participation. So we do have a 30-day public comment period, which has a notice published in the paper. We have a citizen advisory committee that reviews the plans. We have outreach and consultation, and then we're requesting a city council public hearing to adopt the annual action plan. The action plan also requires an amendment if we are to add, delete, or significantly modify a program, the beneficiaries, or goals for the action plan. The action plan is due to HUD on May 15th. HUD has 45 days to review the plan. And if it's approved, then our grant entitlement amount is available is in our line of credit with HUD. It's available on July 1st. That is our annual action plan. And these are the pro proposed programs by the Community Development Division. We have our own in Ogden down payment assistance program. This is available citywide to low to moderate income home buyers. The home buyer must maintain the house as their primary residence, and the home must pass basic code and safety inspection and lead-based paint inspection. It is a loan, a 0% interest deferred payment loan for down payment or closing costs. It's $10,000 for a low mod income household or 15,000 for Ogden city employees or Ogden teachers and 20,000 for low to moderate income Ogden police officers and firefighters. Our goal for the year is to assist 25 home buyers and our budget is 250,000 of the home grant and 100,000 of home match. We also have an emergency home repair program. This is a loan to address an emergency event that threatens the health and safety of the home and or the household. The loans are up to $5,000 and they are 0% interest deferred payment. They are due on sale. So it is a loan that gets paid back when the home is sold. Um, it is for very low income home owners at at least 50% of area median income or below. Sorry, it is available citywide and the home must be owner occupied. And our goal is five emergency home repair loans for the year, and our budget is 40,000 of CDBG funds. And we have the Quality Neighborhoods, our federal fund funds, and that is housing purchase, rehab, and resale program. The city purchases the homes, renovates it, making the substantial repairs needed to bring the home up to quality standards, and then sells the home to a low to moderate income home buyer. Home buyers must may obtain their own mortgage, but they can apply for the own in Ogden for down payment assistance. 
And then we have the Quality Neighborhoods Federal Funds for new housing construction. And we are partnering with a community housing, a community development housing organization, we call it CHODO, to build new homes. The homes sell to low to moderate income home, home buyers at 80% of area median income or below. And they may also get down pay, the own and apply for the own and Ogden down payment assistance. So our current project is at 2809 Jackson, and we are partnering with Utah Nonprofit Housing to build that home. And that would be bud funded with our home CHOTO funds. And it is, it's underway now and expected to complete in fiscal year 25. And the Quality Neighborhoods Federal Funds also budget includes CDBG, Home, Home Match, and Home Choto Funds. So our, at this time, our HUD entitlement awards for fiscal year 25 are not known. They have not been posted yet. So this program, the Quality Neighborhoods Program, will be the adjusting budget line. So if we get more funds than this year's, so we're using this year's entitlement award. If we get more funds, that this program will increase. If we get less, this program will absorb that decrease. And our goal is to rehab five homes in the year and our and to complete the one Chodo project, which is new construction of a house, a single family home. And this is our website, which um, we showed a we have available to homeowners to see what projects are available. Once the home is completed, this page will be up, up uh, updated with a link to the MSL page. MLS. MLS. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And we do have a tenant based rental assistance. This is a brand new program. Um, we received the grant in 2021, and Ogden Housing Authority was selected as a subrecipient. Um, we are providing tenant based rental assistance with supportive services. So the city is the grantee. We are receiving the funds, and the Housing Authority is administering it for the city. So the qualifying populations are homeless people, people at risk of homeless, veterans and their families that are experiencing homelessness, and persons fleeing domestic violence, date violence, stalking, and human trafficking. So the, the way the program works is 30% of the beneficiary's income will go to rent and the program pays the rest. And it also pays a utility allowance and supportive services. Our budget is 1.3 million. Um, that's for the whole term of the, the full four years of the grant. And our goal is to house 15 people per year. Currently we have um, seven people in the program, five literally from off the street and two were at risk of homeless that have been served this year. So this is our first year. Our goal is 15, so we do have openings still for that program. Have we reached out to organizations like YCC that might have connections on, yes. mm -hmm. on, on some of those qualifying populations? Yes, Ogden Housing Authority has been doing great um, outreaching to YCC, OWCAP, um, and different organizations that work with homeless people. So yeah, we have. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, and the Business Information Center is my, um, administering our CDBG funded business loan programs. We have the micro enterprise loan program. A micro enterprise is a business with five or fewer employees, one of whom is the owner. And the micro enterprise business owner's household income must be low to moderate income to qualify for this program. The loans are up to $90,000 for direct business expenses or for training. Um, up to uh, The loans are up to 15% and may be lower if based on experience, collateral, and if the owner is receiving training. The microenterprise owner with less than three years experience must attain, attend a city approved training program and the city can re will reimburse for that cost. Our goal is to assist 10 low to moderate income microenterprise business owners in the year and our budget is 300,000 of CDBG and 308,174 of CDBG CV, which is the CARES Act. So that is um, the CARES Act funding that it requires all the um, requirements of CDBG, plus it must be in response to the COVID um, pandemic. We also have the Small Business Loan Program. This is loans to businesses that commit to create full-time jobs. The loans are up to $90,000, up to 15% interest, and they may receive lower interest based on experience collateral and if there's uh, the business owner has training. The goal is to create full, five full-time equivalent jobs 
and our budget is 400,000 of CDBG and 174,794 of CDBG CV for the year. You say that fast. Can I ask a question too? Sure. Yes. Um, I was just curious. Um, what happens if the businesses don't make it? Do they, they're required to pay back the loan, or what are the terms? Right. It is so. This is a CDBG activity. So there is a national objective, which would be the full time job creation. So they have to commit to that. If they don't, then we do. We can call the collect and call the loan due. Okay. I was just curious. You know, maybe the success rate would be interesting to know how they're doing because I know a couple of them that aren't making it so I'm just curious if the business, the business fails yeah if the business so doesn't at, continue once the jobs are created then there's no HUD requirement after that we've met our national objective so that would be a city uh, business decision whether or not how they well we would collect they'd have to pay back the loan though. right the loan committee Regardless would review it and and decide on how they're going to collect yes mm -hmm. and they may have Put up collateral potentially as a yeah. oh yes there is a trustee often on property and uccs that are filed to collateralize the loan okay and we have the special economic development projects this program is flexible to address the city's economic development needs projects are selected based on need and economic impact to the community target areas are central business district the airport key corridors, distressed areas, and historic districts. A wide variety of topic projects may be funded, such as loans to businesses to start up and create jobs, or to remove a blighted building, or to address a low income area need. The goal is to complete one project every other year, and our budget is 100,000 of CDBG funds. And here's just a snapshot of what our um, overall budget looks like for the year. Kind of hard to see. But. Okay. We did um, receive three comments at the Make Ogden Open House event. Um, and here they are, if you can read those. Okay, and I would um, like to just bring up an information item, um, the Healthy Homes Grant. The Weber Morgan Health Department has been awarded $2 million of HUD Healthy Homes Grant to protect children and their families from housing-related health and safety hazards. The program takes a comprehensive approach to addressing housing-related hazards in a coordinated fashion rather than addressing a single hazard at a time. So eligible activities include the abatement of HUD's 29 Healthy Home housing hazards, which would include mold, lead, allergens, asthma, carbon monoxide, home safety. There's a whole list of 29 different things that can be addressed. They plan to start the program in the spring, and the goal is to um, assist 32 homes, rehabilitating 32 homes in the year for one year. And our budget, and so the city has in-kind $12,000 of Ogden City staff time, which um, includes my time in, in offering help with marketing, outreach, and technical assistance. And some of our staff will be assisting also with scope of work and different things as the county gets up to speed on the grant. And this is the service area, includes um, the Ogden City Census tracts and then two outside of Ogden in, uh, in South Ogden. And I would like to introduce Michaela Harris is here, here, the deputy director of the health department, to say a few words. Come on up, come on up, Haley. Either, or oh, sorry, Michaela. <laughs> I said Haley, didn't I? It's Michaela. Yeah, Michaela. Michaela Harris, right? Yes, Michaela Harris. Yeah. Thanks. I'm the deputy. Sorry, I called you Haley. So. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm the deputy director of the Weber Morgan Health Department, and um, just we're so excited about this grant. Slightly terrified, but. Um, we're doing our best to get it up and running. And I want to thank Kathy and Elaine for helping us because they really provided so much information um, to help us get this going. Um, yeah, uh, every year, the health department, you know, we respond to hundreds of housing complaints and really have no um, long-term solution for a lot of the things that we see. Um, in addition, we are investigating um, elevated uh, blood lead levels in children and that usually turns into a housing investigation to you know try to identify the source um, so this money will will um, 
really help to address multiple childhood diseases um, and injuries like asthma and, and again the the lead levels by allowing us to you know do things in a more comprehensive way. Um, so I think just some a few details about the program that I wanted to um, talk about were. Um, in addition to low-income families with children, the program is also open to homeowners um, who are 60, or excuse me, 62 and older that meet the income limits. So that does um, broaden the, the scope. Um, in addition, rental properties might be approved for work even if the owner is not low income, um, provided that the renter is qualifies for the program and that the owner agrees to rent to low-income individuals for three years after the project is completed. And that could potentially affect, there are about 5,700 units in our target area. And I know um, the, the map wasn't contiguous, it's not just all Ogden City, but in the area that we've identified with the housing issues, um, that's quite a lot of units. Uh, we're limiting the projects to about $10,000 um, and our priorities again are, are lead, but we can really work on a lot of different things, ventilation, mold, radon, um, fire and fall hazards, things like that. So it's very exciting. Yeah. We're excited to, uh, get it up and going. And we project that we will be taking our first houses at the end of the month. So. Do you know if other communities that are involved are also doing in-kind donations or is Ogden City? Ogden City um, and then the South state and... division of environmental quality has um, contributed about 125,000, but no other uh, cities. No, no, not at this time. Um, I will say that we would accept Sure. Any <laughs> partnerships <laughs> that would, would that are uh, willing, and so I I do think that we'll be presenting and and you know approaching South Ogden, Washington Terrace, um, some other places that are impacted by this grant. So yeah, this is our first time with a HUD grant. Yeah. So um, normally these go to mm -hmm. you know the cities right or the housing authorities. Um, there are a few health departments who do at Salt Lake. City has this program, but they are through their uh, city or county as well. So it's a little bit different for the health department to do this, but we're doing it. So <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. What, what will be the process for you to follow up with the 5,700 units in the area? So are, will you reach out to them or are they, are you expecting them to reach out to you? How does that work? Well, I think there'll be a little bit of both, right? Um, we are putting together our uh, advertising and social media t sort of um, plans. And um, I think, and you know, looking at the, at the map, it's hard to just say, um, <laughs> we have this plan come to us. We, we have to sort whether they live in the, in the target area. So, we're still working on that. Um, I think that the idea will be that there will be a screening tool that somebody could go online and kind of fill out their information and then we can start start there. We also have community health workers that do a lot of events around the cities um, that we will try to get the information out and just uh, create like a very easy application to start. So a little both, I guess, if that answers your question. Great. Thanks. Okay. We are happy for your support. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And now you, we'll, yep. we'll review the proposed HELP program guideline changes. So the HELP program loans to property owners to improve the exterior of the home and to address code and safety issues. And the proposed changes are to increase the interest rate from 3% to 4% for a 10-year loan, to increase the interest rate from 4% to 5% for a 15-year loan, and to add income restriction serving applicants at area median income and below, 
and to increase the program parameters to include the Healthy Homes scope of work. So the Healthy Homes program um, it has a limit of $10,000. They can use this as a resource to finish the project. Um, property owners must qualify by basic underwriting and the program is available citywide. And our goal is to assist 18 um, households and our budget is just over 1 million and this is non-federal dollars. So this does not have the HUD restrictions. So Kathy, is this this is the program that we learned last week was exhausted in about two months? Correct, three, year, I think. Or three months. Yeah. And so the, these extra changes are designed to try and help extend that program or Jeremy, if you wanna. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So this is one of the things that uh, we're doing that HELP program has become very popular in the past uh, year. It's been around for about probably six, seven years. Um, and when interest rates were really low, it, it did okay. Um, since interest rates have spiked, it's become in high demand. So we experienced, and I think I explained this last week, but a huge amount of demand where we basically used our allocation for the year within three or four months. And so if you go to the HELP website now, it will say we're not taking applications at this time. That's because we, in order to not just spend down all of our corpus and lose all that money. We had to push pause and wait till we have a uh, the next year. So this is one of the things that we've looked at and said, well, you know, what happens when we raise the interest rate a little bit? Because it was at three and 4%. If we put it uh, more in line with what the market has done to four and 5%, um, what does that do to demand? And then also we've looked at, um, who who really needs this and who do we um, who will benefit for it most? Because anybody that um, currently can apply for this and receive it, which has been great, but because of the demand, we thought maybe we should um, consider those who need it more to be um, more eligible for it, or not more, but to be eligible. And so that's uh, why we're introducing um, the median income, which is not. 80% of median income, which we have on our HUD programs, but it's it's a little higher than just, um, so it's not considered low to moderate income, but it wouldn't be someone that's making tons of money and just is uh, aware of the program taking advantage of it. So those are some of the, the things that we thought would change. It would still give us flexibility uh, to help really preserve these homes that we're, we're desperately trying to protect. Um, as we discuss our natural occurring affordable housing, this is probably our biggest tool that we're trying to keep healthy and keep our housing stock where healthy, where it's with, due to its age, it just needs this. So this is the first thing. It's a Band-Aid. Um, it gives us a little bit. Um, and over, it, it's basically a little bit over a long time adds up to um, a big help, but it won't get us back to that 30 loans a year that we're striving for right now. Right now, if we just go forward with, even with this, we're down to 18 loans per year. And so uh, we will be looking for other ways to increase that so we can increase the amount of loans we're doing. Council member, how you had it? Yeah, I, I had two thoughts or two questions. Um, if we, so, so this is for homeowners. This is for people who are purchasing their home. Correct. Yeah, and this is for so, Obviously, you've done some kind of an assessment of of how many who, who the people are that have received the loans in the past. Are they where do they fit in this low to moderate scale? And, no, I don't know that we have an analysis. We could do that and see where you know who are the people applying for, or do they where will they fit now? But the majority of them, I mean, we do have to qualify them, and it is a loan. And I mean, I don't have that exact. Demographically, these are all mm -hmm. people at median income, but based on the homes that we um, renovate, um, I think it'd be safe to say that most of the people applying that we would still qualify. So, um, yeah, it, it wouldn't, it doesn't make sense to my mind that, I mean, people that it, usually if they own a home, they, they qualify to own that home and they, and they don't do that on a, on a, uh, a low income level. Um, and the, the name of the loan, the HELP loan, the Home Exterior Loan Program, was partially designed to make sure that our city looks good. You know, um, I, I, I guess, and I'm, I'm not saying that 
people that make some money can't can't keep their house up. I'm not saying that at all, but um, it kind of seems like it's from a from a the perspective of of a well perspective that I have, I guess, is that we want to keep the exteriors of people's homes up, and I don't really care how much they make. Um, this is obviously a really popular program, and and I'm hoping that you mentioned it was a band aid. Hopefully, we can figure out how to how to not restrict it in the future. We can get enough money into the thing to make this thing the in and outs cover themselves, and and we can and people that want or or need these kind of helps. I mean, you know, uh, it, it doesn't include help for a, a sewer line, and there's lots of those going on right now. Right. They're expensive. Um, you know, roofs are lots more expensive than they used to be. You know, things of that nature. It, it, I, I, I'm hoping we can kind of get this thing up. But, but if you've done the analysis, I, it just doesn't make sense that there's a lot of people that are on a, on a low income status mm -hmm. that are homeowners. Yeah, and that's that's why we haven't we've done it at median income, not below median income. So we could tell you what those numbers are. I don't have them, but it's. Um, it's they wouldn't qualify for our HUD programs. They're making more than that. So they could definitely, if they did, they could apply for a HELP loan and get that. But we're not capping it um, at that same level that we do our HUD, our HUD income or the HUD programs that we have. So um, ultimately, we would love to be able to provide this to everyone, like we've had in the past. But because it's um, so there's so much demand for it, um, we try and figure like well. You know who if you have choices and other people have other yeah, I, choices I, maybe I, I they can get, use those you got to make a choice those. that's what yeah. you, that's the so, choice you want to make sounds yeah. good we have a question from council member yeah. and then we'll go to vice chair white and then council member Greg. okay well and i'm just gonna um kind of to follow up on those lines too i do recall and maybe i'm wrong about this because i might be misremembering because it's been so long since i've been on the council now but when this program first existed it was only eligible for east central correct and then we expanded it to the whole city. So that also caused an additional demand. And I'm not saying that wasn't wrong because I used this program before I was ever a council member. It was wonderful. Um, so I think that's part of the issue. But I also, I feel like I have a little concern with um, focusing on a certain income, but then increasing the interest rate at the same time. They kind of seem like oxymorons to me in a way um, that were, I mean, I realize that the area median income is not the lowest of incomes in the community, but um, that gives me a little bit of a challenge to think about. Um, and to your point, I think that some people could have purchased their home in the past. They would not be able to buy their home now, today, and doing those major repairs would be very difficult, especially for people that are more of a fixed income. So I think you know, that kind of applies to the income restriction. So yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to an income restriction because I think that that's correct, that there's perhaps people um, that are in different uh, statuses in life that they could get equity loans or other kinds of loans to their own bank. So I do appreciate how it's a very flexible program, um, but I just I have a little bit of challenge with that idea of increasing the interest rate and then focusing on lower on the income at all. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. I think um, when we look at this, and if you were to go and get a home equity loan from a bank or something, Interest rates, I don't know what you're looking at now, but you're probably closer to seven, eight, nine percent. Six and a half at credit unions right now. Okay. So, so but yeah, that's somebody that really has got great credit in that. I would, anyway, so I felt like this is a little bit of a bump, but it's not, um, it doesn't crush someone. I mean, it's all relative to what, how things are going, but um yeah, certainly 4% okay. still a really good rate. Okay. It's a great rate. Right, right. I'm just saying that, that but if you're focusing on people who have a lower income, why would you yeah. make it cost them more to borrow the money? Yeah. And again, it's it's the balance of trying to keep the program healthy. How do we generate enough return that we can keep lending out money and, um, you know, just being able to, to stay in business? Vice Chair White? Yeah, just real quick. You said it's to, to property owners. Does that... Um, does that include a property owner that rents their house out, I guess, is the question. Yes. Uh, that okay. is an eligible thing. You, that is el yeah. eligible. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. so. And then what's your idea? I mean, and then what's that, in adding that, what's the parameter, program parameters of that healthy homes? Um, I know. We so that's the it. list, the 29 um, items that uh, Kathy okay. mentioned. Those are the happy, healthy, healthy, yeah, yeah. 
healthy. Yeah, they, yeah. So, have, that's the list. Right. It's pretty so what, it, what we wanted to do is say, you know, maybe the the money they get from the health department to do it isn't enough to cover everything they need. And that's so right. we wanted to make sure that, okay, here's some other, we'll embrace all these things. They can be, they become eligible now. So if you wanted to become fully, have a healthy, happy home, you know, you could also use health funds mm -hmm. to, to make that happen. So, yeah. Councilmember Graff. Thank you. I also support the the idea that we're going to set an income level that we don't eclipse at the higher end. It just makes money available for those that need it, in my mind, more desperately. Um, how did you decide to go from three to four and four to five when um, my credit union says 6.95% for the first 12 months is an intro rate. And then um, depending upon loan to value, you're going to, it's going to fluctuate a little bit and up to 8.75%. So th this is a, still a relative bargain. Is it because of the income demographic that you didn't want to go more than a percentage point? Well, and we're not in the I mean, banking business. We're not in the banking business and we're not competing with banks. I mean, we have a very small portfolio and this really is, is uh Councilman Harris said, this is really Ogden's best effort. Like, how do we keep our housing stock healthy? How do we encourage people to do this? Because anyone that is eligible can go to a bank and get a loan. Credit union, they can do that. How do we incentivize someone to really take care of their home? And if we can offer a lower interest rate um, than the market and say, hey, look, you know, I know you don't really, you can get by without doing this on this house and, you know, getting it fixed up and be okay. But what if you were able to get a loan for, you know, a really comparatively great deal? Um, that just, it absolutely achieves the objective we're aiming for of keeping our housing stock healthy. And so that's that's why we are we do it at a discount. It's not that we're trying to compete or make a ton of money off this, but really the first priority is just preserving our housing stock. Yeah, I was just curious as to where you lose, at what point do you lose demand? Yeah. And I would say you could just go back in time and see when, you know, when interest rates were so low and we're at three, we we're almost exactly the same as them. And right. our demand, we were marketing like crazy. We were knocking on doors with flyers and stuff. And people are like, mm, I don't know. I can go to my credit union and get one. And usually we're just, you know, well, we'll be nicer to you. And, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but, and yeah, this market, it gives us more of an opportunity to offer an incentive. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, our schedule is um, the public comment period is April 7th to May 6th. Um, the, we requested the public hearing from May 7th. We submit to HUD on May 8th, and then our entitlement awards will be available on July 1st. And then in the fall, we begin our amendment process. And I just wanna mention that April is Fair Housing Month and everyone is protected. Um, it is a right protected by federal law and state, and each citizen is entitled to access to housing opportunities regardless of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. The number one fair housing complaint is based on disability. Last year, 53% of all complaints filed were, with HUD were based on disability. For an example, an apartment complex refusing to designate a handicapped parking spot for a wheel-bound person. This would be considered a reasonable accommodation by HUD. So property owners are responsible for the cost of associated with a reasonable com accommodation, but the person with a disability is responsible for the cost of a modification as, such as a wheelchair ramp. Okay. Thank you for your time on that. And the Disability Law Center in Salt Lake City will advocate for all of the seven protected classes. They specialize in disability, but they advocate for anyone with a fair housing complaint. Thank you for your time today. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right. Um, see Mara in the room. Gary, is it okay if we uh, go to Mary next? Mara next. I'm just really struggling today. I don't know. Didn't, I didn't eat my Wheaties this morning, I guess. Um, but um, Mara, um, if you would like to come up with the administrative update, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Um, I really just had a, a couple things that I know that you were, you were asking about, and that's the the fencing that we have on 25th Street at, at that um, 
property that was torn down and and we Ogden City owns that fencing and there was some concerns about the perception with the razor wire on there because that that was really left over from when we were concerned about um, the the safety of that site and of course it's been torn down so we're working with the contractor to get that removed and it, it'll probably hopefully it'll be coming down this week sometime and then it could be off for several months but we do anticipate that that uh, construction will start again there and so we may be putting that back again during during the most vulnerable phases of construction which tend to be the the framing um, before there's drywall and and that up so you may may see it come back as as the as that um gets rebuilt there but we'll we'll try we're working with the contractor to get that removed here pretty soon would the so, city be putting up the fencing or would the contractor? We actually own the fencing because of the, during the timing of, of the situation with the prior building, we we, we went ahead and um, installed that because of, of the safety concerns that we had. So we didn't, we didn't wait for that. We just, we just hired that. And so we, we, we kind of have a, um, an agreement to leave that up there because it's already in place and and so we we own it but um because you know we're we're going to be accommodating and the contractors accommodate to us so they'll they'll take that razor wire part of it off and um and then if if it you know needs to be put up again just to secure the site it, it might might go up again but it's kind of how that came about but we're um fully aware of uh, we're in the running for the best main street and in the US and we don't want to detract from that accolade. So that could be part of it. Council Member Jeff, you had a Yeah, thanks. You mentioned just now and others have, I've had this pop up elsewhere where this building is being perhaps built again. Will it have to go through the planning department and planning commission and landmarks again, or can they just submit the blueprints, pull a permit and go to work? Uh, because there there was significant conversation around that building was all wrong as far as height and that sort of thing was concerned, even though it was approved by the planning commission and landmarks before that, which was kind of, for those of us on the planning commission during the time, that was kind of the stamp of approval. If it got by them, it, you know, and the flip side of that is it stood in plywood for so long, it it was hard to envision that building was going to fit in historically. So it, it help us understand a little bit more about where the developer is with a rebuild on this. Yeah, they're they're working with the city to to move forward with with a plan that we're we're amenable to. So I think it's it's not going to go back through a process. That's what I understand, and I I do also think that the the height was was consistent at the time with the requirements. So, yeah. yeah. So that was yeah. There was some concern about that, but it it was consistent at the time. Any other questions for Mary on the administrative side? I had just one. Just I'm um, just excited to see the water start or the the. Earth starting to warm up again a mm -hmm. little bit, um, even though we have a snowstorm this weekend. Um, it seems like last year, kind of around this time, we start we had some updates and some, you know, maybe communication regarding safety around the river and, you know, the, uh, you know, the the control. We had such a nice soft landing with the way the water came out mm -hmm. last year, and you know, we had we still have significant snow this year. So is that something that we can? maybe have as part of a discussion in the future or just yeah, a, a update. Absolutely. And we we can um we're we're going to be we're we're really um gearing up on on our side to have the same level of of response if if we need to. We're not anticipating to have the the flooding um concerns that we had last year, but we're 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 setting up for that possibility the same way we did last year. So the we're already just just tracking the the flows and how that correlates to um, the, in, you know water levels increasing and it, it kind of where it's hitting the bridges and we're and going under um, uh, Washington Boulevard and so we're we're monitoring all of that right now and um, and then our you know communication staff is is going to be um, gearing up to put out some warnings about about the river and especially you know as it warms up and kids kids around there and I, I know that we've collaborated in the past with you know your team as needed to make sure that we're 
getting the message out there. Um, but uh, we'll be we'll be making sure that we're getting them, you know, just communicating to the public and continue to keep an eye on the situation. Um, you know, some of the partners that we have that are affected by flooding can be our marathon. And so we're starting to, you know, communicating with those people. Um, we have the Ogden Music Festival down at Port Benaventura, and I know they've been, um, you know, communicating with the county and other people to keep an eye on those spaces. Um, of particular interest to our neighborhood, the uh, ice dam that broke up on the mountain and flooded the yeah, uh, well, it didn't yeah. really cause major damage at that point, mm -hmm. but it was uh, it was certainly concerning and eye opening and uh, and fun and yeah, exciting. So, is there any actions? You know, maybe flying drones up there. And it seems like that's a good point. I will, I will, I will ask about that too. We didn't talk about about drones, but yeah, that's, the, yeah just chief, any unexpected last year areas up there. Mm -hmm. and they, Gave him a hard time about hiking when they have drones. So yeah, yeah. But he, okay, yeah. If it was a nice day like today, we're, we're maybe he's going to want to go back up there yeah, again. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, up next, we have Gary Williams, our city attorney, to come and talk to us about the ethics training for public office off. I don't know what I mean. Officers and employees training. And open public meetings training. That's right. Do, open right? meetings and and uh, conflicts of interest is kind of what I would call it. Um, I, I this is your cue to get lunch or dinner. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You got to do something to keep you interested. I know that I'm in competition for, with IT for the excitement of my yeah, trainings yeah. tonight. So nice. I'll do what I can. Here's some handouts. They're just the same slides I'm going to show you just in case you had some questions after the fact. Um, for most of you, this will be a review. For a couple of you, it'll be a, a new presentation. And really, there's there's um, no intent for you to gain a full understanding of these topics that are just touched upon, but really to kind of prompt you to think about them as the issues come up in the future. And so let's start with the Open and Public Meetings Act. Okay. All right, I'll go. Um, that go. All right. What does open open meetings do? It requires that the government act openly, and ensures the liberations to allow for open a public process. It speaks for itself, but the question often is: is what is a public meeting? And that's any meeting where there's a quorum, um, except in a few uh, exceptions. Any meeting where there's a quorum of this body, where you're discussing city matters, where you're receiving comments from the public, where you're acting. Um, and, and any body that has ju jurisdiction or advisory power. In other words, even those bodies that just give you recommendations are also public bodies that have to follow the open meetings law. There's a couple of things that aren't in the definition of a meeting that comes up every year, especially around Christmas time. What about the social party? What about the Christmas party? What, what about the chance meeting? There happens to be four council members all in one place. That is not a violation. Um, that's right. That's right. So there are a couple of exceptions for open and public meetings, and those are under the closed meeting exceptions. And the next two slides talk about those exceptions. And typically when we have a closed meeting, you'll usually have me speaking in the beginning saying, okay, this is the exception we're under. And this is, and I say that so that you have an idea of what the limits are of what we can talk about in the closed meeting. And so the, the categories are a, a, the character, competence, or health of an individual is sometimes the topic of a meeting, um, collective bargaining strategy sessions, um, a strategy session on um, pending or reasonably imminent litigation, discussion regarding security personnel devices or systems. Also, I don't, I don't know that we've ever had one of these, but also investigative proceedings regarding criminal misconduct. Occasionally those are those are happening in other bodies. And then um, there's two different exceptions for the purchase, exchange, lease, or sale of both real property or water rights. And those are, those are often the things that we talk about, for example, in, in RDA closed sessions. Uh, next question is, are there any meetings that have to be closed? The answer is no. You could choose to do everything out in the open the, the problem is on some of those topics are very sensitive and you may not get a candid discussion. 
And so those closed session topics are in, are are um, intended to help you get more candid information on very sensitive topics. Um, and uh, a, a closed meeting that is on various different topics. You can't have a closed meeting on one topic and then go to a non-closed meeting topic. And so every once in a while, you'll see me on the sidelines saying, I think we're maybe going astray and we need to get back on the original purpose of the closed session. That's the reason. And, um, but, but whether you hold the closed session itself is always discretionary, not mandatory. I have a question, Gary. Yeah. So we've got seven reasons we can go into closed session. Yeah. But if we de depart from one of the reasons, the main reason we maybe went into closed session to another one that was a reason. Now, I know there's different requirements for the recorder and whatnot. Right. Is, is there some reason that it has to be noticed the way it is in order for us to do it? Or can we change? Can we Can we go to a different reason? We actually notice it pretty broadly for that reason, because very often it's for multiple purposes. You might have a real property transaction that also goes into character or competence. You might have another transaction that goes into security issues and that sort of stuff. And so um, and so that's why we notice it the way we, we do with, with all the available opportunities. And that's the way a lot of other cities do it as well. So, so does the recorder then sitting over there and they're saying, oh, we changed the topic. I got a different rule now. And sometimes, for example, in a not so long ago meeting, we had two different topics and one required the recording and one didn't. Mm -hmm. And so we have an understanding of, of what needs to be recorded and what doesn't. But it can't be spontaneous, in other words. Right. So that's, that, that, that's kind of maybe what I'm and, asking. And many times I will be um, stating what the purposes are so the recorder is keyed into what they need to do. They know what they're doing. Okay, good question, thank you. Um, there's a process to closing a, a, a meeting and the number one requirement is that you start in an open meeting. So you have to have an open meeting to get to a closed meeting. The public needs to know that you've got into a closed meeting. And you have to have a quorum present, you have to have two thirds vote and, um, and you're, you're very acquainted with that process. There's some things you just can't do in a closed meeting. And that is any final decisions. You can't approve any ordinance, resolution, rule, regulation, contract, or appointment. Um, none of those can be done in a closed meeting. There are, there are rare occasions where you might interview somebody to fill an elected position. For example, if there was a vacancy in the city council or mayor position, for example, there's a rule that allows you to interview. Um, the statute says you have to have that interview in the public, which is interesting. Um, but that's just for elected positions. Uh, but all final votes have to be on the open record. Okay, any questions, I guess, before we go to conflicts of interest, any questions about open meetings before we go into conflicts of interest? Okay. So the conflicts of interest laws are, there's about a half dozen of them. The general rule is that you can't use your office for personal benefit and it's prohibited. But there's several different categories that the law kind of outlines. And so this just goes through the categories. And for each one of these categories, there's a whole statutory section. There's also often an ordinance section. And sometimes there's a policy as well. But the first category is you can't take compensation to assist somebody in a municipal transaction without disclosure. This is for any council member that happens to also be an attorney, an architect, an engineer, somebody who's going before the council to represent a client. I don't think any of you fall into that category, but nevertheless, that's there. Um, the next category is uh, many of you will have interest in a business entity regulated by the city, and that's usually most that are within the city. And again, the the, the necessity is just disclose it, and the the, uh, the recorder's office has a disclosure form. You probably do it every year. You just disclose what interest you have in different um businesses and that sort of stuff. If you haven't done that, then get a, get the form from the recorder's office and fill that out. Um, next category is an interest in a business entity doing business with the city. So this is a little different, not regulated, but they actually have contracts with the city. And that does come up now and then. It may even come up with your employer. 
And the employer uh, concept is a little bit of a gray area. You may be in a relatively minor role in the employer's um, categories of employees, and you may not feel like you have a, a, a conflict regarding that employer, and otherwise you might feel like you do. I think that's a case-by-case -case decision that you might want to talk to legal counsel about if you have a concern. But it's been pretty common, although not um, inevitable, that council members often um, don't vote on matters for their own employers. You may have an investment creating a conflict of interest with your duties. You might have an investment in a particular piece of property or something else that might create a conflict. If you think you have any of that, then let's talk about it, help you work through it. Um, and then, of course, any approvals of, co of public contracts with a family member. You guys don't really approve that many contracts. Janine approves some lower level ones, and then you might have to approve some for greater amounts. But nevertheless, that also applies to employees. They can't inv be involved in the public contracts with their own family members. And uh, the council rule, and I say it's a rule, it's not an ordinance, but it's a standard that you set for yourselves is that you don't recuse yourself if you have an immediate or direct financial interest. And I say that because um, there's some cases where you might have an, an immediate and direct financial interest and you might be allowed to vote under state law or even under ordinance. But, but the council said, we're just not gonna do that. Again, that's not a binding law. It's just something you've all kind of got together and said, that's gonna be our standard. Okay, so here's what you do when, when you're in doubt. You, you first of all, disclose the conflict. And there's two times you disclose it. You can disclose it in writing and then in any meeting where the conflict comes up, you can just disclose it verbally. And sometimes the disclosure is the avoidance of the conflict. For example, you may have, you may own a property in a very large um, area of the city that is gonna be rezoned. And you disclose, yeah, I own that little piece of property. It's one of 50 there. I don't view that as a, as a, um, as a conflict of interest, but I've disclosed it, okay? Um, also, when in doubt, call me. Call me and I'll help you work through the problems. Um, you need to reject any cash gifts. I know <laughs> that doesn't include campaign contributions. Those are legitimate. But, but any cash gifts, even small ones, you ought to just avoid. There is an exception as to value because... Um, let's say somebody wants to take you out to lunch. If it's under $50 value and it's an occasional non-money thing, then you, you can consider that an exception, even though it has to do with your council member duties. If the same person were, had a standing appointment to have lunch with you, you know, three times a week, that might be an issue. So it's the occasional and the non-money. Non they can't hand you $40, $40 and say, go buy lunch. You can have you can have a lunch meeting with them without violating that rule. Okay. Again, um, disclose in writing and at the end of the meeting. And then the last thing I always want to say is just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And 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 I say that because the law presumes that the voters, once once the conflict is disclosed, the voters will hold you accountable as to whether you should be held accountable. And so the disclosure is intended by the law to put pressure on you to decide what you're going to do. It doesn't always tell you exactly what you're going to do. Sometimes, like I say, the disclosure is enough to get you past the legal hurdle. And then you have to decide, having made that disclosure, whether your voters will also appreciate you still being involved in that decision. Yes. So how does that take place? During the meeting, you just say, I... I won't be voting on this issue because I have a conflict of interest or do so two way you could do that. You could say, for example, I want everybody to know that I own a piece of property in this new zone proposal area. And you could say, and for that reason, I decide, I decide to recuse myself. And then the standard practice, at least in this council has been that you actually walk out for the vote. So you're not there looking over everybody's shoulder. So that takes place in the council chamber. Yeah. Not in yeah. this. Yeah. But, like I say, sometimes the disclosure does avoid the conflict. So there's other times you may say, yeah, in that five block area, I have a piece of property, but there's a legislative decision. I'm going to disclose it 
but I feel like I can still vote on it. And you will have met your legal duty. And then it's just the question of, and then it's just the question of whether others will agree with you on that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the disclosure is key. And then your decision is kind of secondary as to what you're going to do with it. I usually say it in this room too, though, when we're talking about the topic. Yeah. And um, I've done it a couple of times and sometimes I'll say, I don't know. Um, one example is I work for Select Health, but I don't have anything to do with contracting or any influence on that whatsoever. And because the city might have a contract with them, I have nothing to do with making the decision about that's the health plan they choose. So I just say, hey, I work for Select Health, but I don't feel it's a conflict because I have nothing to do with any part of the business on either end. So then I don't leave that. I just let these people know I'm going to say that out in the open too. So, so if, if Angela was concerned about her job security, that would make it a conflict though, right? Well, if select help, if they do. said, you know what, yeah. you, you, you really made us look yeah. bad because you voted in opposition to what we would have preferred. I mean, or, or perhaps even worse, if they say, you know, we're really counting on you for this vote. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. But, no, I, but I, somebody might, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah, if there was some influence or something that could happen to me because then, yeah. Agreed. Okay, any other questions? Those are all helpful. Uh, again, just, just think of about those things as they come up and we're always available to help you kind of talk through them. There, there isn't any case law in Utah, but there is case law in other cities that says that while usually my duty um, of confidence is to the whole city, if an individual council member has a, an issue, a personal issue as to conflict of interest in their official duties, I can treat that as a confidential conversation and therefore it's confidential from your other council members. And, and so I've always, I've always viewed that as what the courts would do if they were presented that opportunity in Utah and I've always followed that as well. Okay. Any questions? Okay, it's IT's turn. All right. Thank you, Gary. While we're waiting for Brian to come up, um, I have uh, a little sheet that uh, every employee in the city is asked to sign. It's an ethics commitment. And basically it just kind of reviews some of the things that uh, Gary just uh, reviewed. So if you would, I'm gonna pass these out. If you could uh, take one and sign it and give it back to me, I'll get it to HR. Thank you. Next up, we have Brian Martinson, our IT manager to enlighten us on Fishing, probably. Yeah, so we're kind of going to talk about all of cybersecurity. But all first of, of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, this is the first time I've got the opportunity to come in person and actually talk on this. So uh, we actually talked a bit about this as a city uh, last week, quite a bit um, in depth. And we wanted to share a bit with you guys kind of what um, that is. So cybersecurity is a very, very broad topic. Um, we want to focus in on specifically end user uh security, which we believe is very important. Uh, one of the more key important parts of cybersecurity. There's always the technology part and there's always the user part. And so we wanna talk about the, the user part. So we gathered some statistics here. Uh, one in 99 emails uh, these days have malicious content in them. Um, there's over a million new malware threats every day. Uh, but there's more and more targeting mobile, 5,000 mobile malware released every day. Uh, that's iPads and phones, all those kind of mobile devices. Um, and, and this was a pretty staggering effect factor here. More than 99% of cyber attacks rely on humans. So some kind of human intervention. They needed us to click on something, agree to something, do something. Um, and, and we'll talk about various ways how they do that. But uh, that's a pretty large amount, 99%. Uh, so 82% of breaches rely on humans. So the difference between an attack and a breach is uh, an attempt, an attack, and a breach would be a successful attack, right? Uh, so 49% of breaches involved credentials, which is, as we know them today, usernames and passwords, right? 1% uh, are responsible for the 88% of the attack. So 1% of users are responsible for 88% of every attack company-wide. Uh, so that's that's a pretty staggering amount. That is a new, for the, from this year, from a uh, proof point, a very reliable uh, secure, cybersecurity firm. Um, also, some things we don't always see every day. Over 7,500 companies are targeted every day 
Um, we don't always hear about them. We hear about some of the bigger ones and maybe some of the mainstream ones. Uh, MGM Grand, AT&T just the other day announced a huge team mobile, right? We've seen some of those, uh, but they mostly target small, medium, large, all of the above. Um, so it was important to know. Um, the the cybercrime cost worldwide continue to go up. It is at $8 trillion a year uh, industry. Uh, that was as of 2023. It's ex expected to be at 10 and a half trillion by 2025. Uh, to put that into perspective of how fast that's growing, it was at $3 trillion just before COVID, the pandemic hit. Um, so it's growing very rapidly. Um, I pulled some interesting email, uh, based on emails for Ogden City, some interesting stats here. Um, roughly sent and received out of OgdenCity.com citywide, the, our emails, we had 10,768,000 sent and received emails of which um, technology and IT, 9 million and 36,000 were blocked and never made it to anybody's inbox. Um, as much spam as we all see, I know. Um, the, I, the reason that's important um, is because those were all guaranteed issues, malicious, et cetera. So you can see how often this happens and why some of those numbers are so high, even in our own area. Um, so some of the aftermath, some, some things that we wanted to share, uh, the average cost of recovery um, of, after an attack is at $5 million right now. That's just a medium that, you know, that will vary greatly depending on the company and what was stolen and the everything like that. But the average is $5 million. Uh, most small to medium businesses don't survive that. They don't, they can't pay it. They can't afford it. They end up closing doors. Um, that's a significant amount of money. Um, sometimes there's other, these are some of the things I've listed here, you know, service disruption, right? If if all of the computers or Wi-Fi and technology all stopped, we'd all have a hard time doing at least some or all parts of our job, depending on where we're at. Um, intellectual property that might get stolen or lost. Um, loss of business information, uh, maybe sensitive information. Right? There's always recovery costs, reputational damage that happens, sometimes that's uh, the biggest thing. A personal theft or what we call PII, personal identifiable information, um, which on my next slide, I'll kind of go over a little bit about what that means. Um, and really it is anything that can identify you as an individual. Um, so all of these things on here, I won't list them all out, but these are all things that are classified as PII or personal info identifiable information that we have to protect. Um, of these, some are maybe more sensitive than others, right? Um, a couple I want to point out that uh, would be more valuable to, as if I were a hacker, think like a hacker, I was a bad guy. Um, I would definitely want login credentials. I want to point that one out and probably email. And there's a big reason for that. If I have your login credentials, uh, I, I could maybe... Even just to Ogden City, it's either a high likelihood they're either reused or something similar, or I get in there and I can then go to maybe Facebook. And when I hit reset password there, what does it do? Send you an email to reset it, but I'm in it. So now I can reset your password and get into everything else. So therefore those might be more targeted uh, things, right? So login credentials being a, a, an email being a big one. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about ways they get that, and, and so it's called social engineering. Um, it's defined as any, they, they try to exploit human error or human behaviors, it doesn't even have to be errors, um, just behaviors, uh, with uh, the objective of gaining access to information or services. Sometimes they'll do that by being very nice. Sometimes they'll do that by trying to impose fear or greed or uh, many other things we'll get to in the in the next one, but they'll do that in various ways, but they, they do it all by trying to take advantage of our human nature. Um, if somebody, you know, comes up to you and wants to, you're walking your dog and they, they might ask you, hey, how old's your dog? What's your dog's name? Um, things like that are all typical standard things we might hear from people, right? Uh, but that, that might also be your password. <laughs> and, and you, you know, the things, the more they know, the more they they get to you. So um, this is email or business email compromise and AI is only making this better and easier um, and more advanced. One, one key thing I'll point out there is that 
uh, oftentimes, especially when people were doing it overseas, Russia, China, other other continents, you'd sometimes be able to recognize it because of maybe broken English words or um, things that might stand out. Um, AI is is all but eliminating that. Um, that that is so easy to now write in very proper English um, in those. So they usually get you to try to click on links or downloads. They are now coming through text, social media, phone calls. Uh, they're expanding, right? It's not just emails, but uh, they need your human interaction. Um, these are some of the psychological manipulations, greed, fear. Sorry, did you have a question? No. Oh, I sorry. Scratch my nose. Oh, sorry. I just saw the top of my head. So, <laughs> um, so, so these are some of the things you might see or that you could point out in emails, in phishing emails, texts, um, even voice elicitations, if they were to call you. Um, that they would try to elicit to try to get you to do something like click a link or download something or run something. Um, greed, fear, and a sense of urgency, um, curiosity, maybe sympathy, uh, respect for authority. Um, you know, I've seen multiple that are that are just, you know, hey, this is the police. We've noticed illegal content on your computer and you need to talk to us and give us log in here within an hour or you're in trouble. Um, something like that, right? Trying to instill some kind of urgency and fear, respect for authority. A lot of those things are there um, in even simple emails of what they do. They, they'll even take, take advantage of people's helpfulness. They just wanna help. Maybe somebody's carrying a baby and they wanna help out um, and they'll take advantage of those kind of situations. They'll try to cause confusion. They'll try to gain trust in some way. Um, these are things we commonly see. Uh, so phishing is when hackers try to get PII or personal identifiable information, such as login credentials or account information. But they do that by masquerading as a reputable entity or a person. Um, and again, those are using email, IMing, texting, phone, social media, all of the above. Um, and the, the best advice we want to, to put out there is that act like your personal identifiable information is out there because it probably is sometimes by no fault of your own. Um, I'm personally a T-Mobile customer. I got my notice in the mail uh, that my stuff was stolen and they said, hey, sorry, it's only all this stuff. Uh, but that means that all of that data and all of my data is now on the dark web, even though I didn't click on a link. Um, all of my information is still out there. So act like it is because it probably is. Um, so. Ransomware continues to be the biggest thing after clicking on a link. Um, it's only one type of malware that can happen, but I wanted to hit on it because it continues to be a huge uh, thing. I pulled some numbers from this last year to kind of put this into perspective um, a little bit. So it was it accounted for 62% of all malware incidents. So by and large, the majority. Um, and 24% of the breaches that actually got in, that's how they got in. Um, initially. Uh, of those, 60% paid the ransom after getting all, all that data looked at. Well, does everybody understand what ransomware is? Do you want me to explain that? Everybody familiar with it? Yeah. I mean, I've watched the movies about it. But, yeah. So, sorry, I, I should have started with that. I apologize. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. ransomware is, if, if malware got on your computer, what they like to do is encrypt something. So, think of, even in your personal life, if um, I, I would use the example of like my my kids. Um, if if my kids' photos, if they they're all digital, and if they got encrypted, I wouldn't be able to open them, view them, see them. I'd see that they exist, but they would leave a note, and I could it would open it, and it would just simply say, "You must pay fifty thousand dollars in Bitcoin," and then I'll un, un encrypt your files. And it's it, it's a terrible situation. This happens to businesses and personal people alike. Um, but that's where a lot of money comes from. So, so that's what, what this is. Um, it's always highly advised to not pay ransom. Um, and that's working with CISA and D Department of Homeland Security, all of that. But sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, it, I, you know, you got me concerned. I mean, yeah. I, 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 really, I, I really don't want to be a, a, a moron on, and do something stupid. You know, like I, I think uh, they prey on people like me. But if I if you have your data backed up in an off-site location, is the encryption still going to lock that stuff up, or how does all that work? How, how... If it has access to it, it can. So if you have it encrypted, that is really really great. Um, in fact, one of my last ones is, is how to back up your data. So 
that is a, a key thing. Back data backup is absolutely one on one and a fantastic thing uh -huh. to do. Um, but you want to put it, make sure it's offsite and offline is the key there. Because if it's accessible to that same device, it's still going to get caught. Um, so if it's not accessible somewhere, you know, unplugged offline, um, that's that's your best security uh, so, method. So y'all here taking care of the city. Yes, you, we're we're redundant, I, I assume. And yes, we, we yeah. do this. So this three, two, one model um, is something we follow here with everything. This is goes from email to our file shares to all of our servers and and uh, information technology as it comes through. Um, we we follow this this all back uh, to a T. I don't want to spend a lot, a lot of time, but could you maybe? We don't have a lot of time. I know uh, this, this, this site. You know your password things. You know if you got, you know my password wallet is saying, hey, you've used that password more than once. You can't do that. What, yes. What, tell me, tell me why that's a deal. Yeah. So, um, uh, actually, that's on my next slide here. Let me let me uh, get to that. One quick thing before I still go, so I want to just get to, to the sixty percent paid ransom and how did that pan out? 4% of people got their data back. 4% out of the 60 that actually paid those millions of dollars. That's that's pretty brutal. And not all of it was uh, usable data because it was in a different format. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to, so two-factor, uh, let me go back here, right? So two-factor authentication is um, where, where that, what's your, to, to get to your question, um, just a password. I, I kind of put this just briefly here. I, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Just a password. This this gives how uh, fast and how long a modern it would take a modern computer to try over and over and over and over again and guess someone's password. Um, and a what they we have and what we recommend is what's called a password manager. So don't store your passwords in the browser when Google Chrome pops up and says, "Hey, would you like to save your password here?" Uh, don't do it. We recommend highly against that. Use a, a reputable password manager. Those encrypt it much. Uh, more secure and every one of them that are reputable will all be in the green immediately and just take care of that. And you don't even have to worry about this. Um, Two-factor authentication is the other part. The city uses that. We've probably all seen it. We use Duo. There are many other companies. Uh, we recommend doing it even in your home. Go to your bank. They all have it available. Go turn it on. Um, it's just that we likened it to a digital deadbolt, just like you have in your front of, of your home. A lock you also have a deadbolt you have two locks there um, it's a little bit of inconvenience having to click yes um, but it is a a whole lot less convenient than have somebody get into your account um, so two two-factor authentication apps even if they broke your what your password is you already stopped them you thwarted them before something even happened so um, prevention right there two-factor authentication um, last slide, top six takeaways. Um, the, the best passwords are, of course, the longer, as we saw in that little slide, we didn't spend too much time on it. Um, 15 plus and using a passphrase, not a dictionary word, those kind of things are always, um, but a key one, again, is two-factor authentication. Um, that can look like in many forms and in many different applications. Um, again, we use Duo here at the city, but um, you can use many different kinds. Two-factor authentication is huge. huge. Keep an eye out for these social engineering. Look for those tactics they try to use. Uh, the end users and, and us, we are the first and the last layer of security. There's technology in between there, but the users can pre both prevent it from coming in and from where it ends. So it's a huge part of security. Um, and, and by that, that means we're the best layer of security. Um, and, and biometrics would cons be considered a second factor of authentication. Yep. Yes. So, so yeah, like, like my phone, I can tell you my, my own personal phone does that. I just look at it and does facial recognition. Uh, that is still one factor authentication because I don't also have a password. I don't require both every time I unlock my phone. Right. Uh, but in my bank account, I would have two factor authentication. So just to, to clarify two factor a little bit, it relies on something, you know, and something you are or have. So biometric, a facial recognition, fingerprint, um, a text, you know, you have a phone, you get a text message code or something you have, as well as something you know, not just one or the other. So two factor. And so we just wanted to get that out because we think knowing knowing is key. That, that was Knowing all right. is half the battle. Yes, yes, exactly. So thank you guys. Thanks, I appreciate Brian. it. Just, if there's any questions, let me know.
All right. Thanks, Brian. All right. We're adjourned. We got a couple minutes before we start up again. So thank you. Okay.